Well, good morning. It's good to see you this morning. We have some visitors with us again. We're certainly pleased that you're here with us. And we're thrilled that you have chosen today to come and be with us. And we ask you to come every opportunity that you can. We enjoy your presence with us this morning. I had the idea of a sermon I was going to do this morning, uh, yesterday, or the day before that, for that matter. And uh, I got up this morning at around 4.30, and uh, this idea came to my mind. And at 6.30, I found myself writing another lesson for you this morning. Uh, because the, the thought of how precious am I came to my mind. And I got, got to thinking, well, that kind of goes in with what I'd already thought about talking about. And so I rewrote it all this morning, and I hope you enjoy it, and I think it, it will mean something to you uh, as we go along. Uh, this morning's lesson, as uh, Robert already read this morning, is how precious am I? Have you ever thought about that? You know, we're all told how wonderful we are and how meaningful we are by our moms and our dads and how precious we are to them. But whenever you look in the mirror and you think of yourself, how do you think about yourself? Do you think of how valuable you might be? If there were a monetary number you could put on yourself, what would that number be? Or with what would you replace yourself? You know, everything has an intrinsic value. You go to trade in your car, they've already determined in their mind what your car is worth. You have your idea and they certainly have theirs. So, everything has a value. But what is that value that's been placed on you? Well, this morning we're going to talk about that. Because there is a value that has been placed on you. And it's one we need to be reminded of often. Turn with me, if you will, to John 3.16. John 3.16. Start off with it. Listen to what God is saying. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Listen to what he's saying. He loved the world that much. That he would give his son. For what? For the world. He would allow his son to die for the world. That those who believe shouldn't perish. There's a condition there. What is that condition? The condition is that I do as He's commanded me to do. That I truly do believe that Jesus is the Son of God and all those things that go along with that. So God's telling you right now how much He believes you're worth. Because we are the world. The value is the Son of God. But how long did it take God to come up with this plan? How long has He been doing it? God loves us and has loved us from the beginning. When I say the beginning, I mean the beginning of everything. God existed before all creation. All creation was created by Him and through Him. We find that in 1 John, the Word. Nothing was created that was made or was made without Him. All things were made through Him. He planned from the beginning to give His Son as a propitiation for our sins. This was in His mind from the beginning. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20. Who verily was foreordained, planned, thought out before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. He's talking about Jesus. Before anything was created, God had planned to give His Son. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10, it says, Herein is love. In other words, this is the paradigm. This is what we should measure everything by. This is the paradigm of love. Not that God loved, not that we loved God, but that He loved us. And sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. In other words, the offering. He took our place. That's how much God loves us. 
this purpose in Christ was one that is eternal. It was preordained before time began. And it will continue afterwards. Because his life was given that the New Testament might be made law, we're told in Hebrews, and that this law, this covenant, is an eternal one. Therefore, that propitiation, his life was given eternally. That's something to think about. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 11 says, According to the eternal purpose, are you listening? Eternal purpose. Which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Are you getting a, an idea of, of what you're worth? In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9, it says, Who hath saved us and called us to be a and holy with a holy calling? Not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ before the, before the world began. Are you hearing this? Before God created this earth, and He created this earth for us. Before He created the universe, which sustains the earth. Everything has a purpose. Before he did any of this, he purposed in his heart and his mind a special place for you. In Titus chapter 1, verse 2. Titus chapter 1, verse 2. In hope of eternal life. Which God and that cannot lie promised before the world began. So again, the question I ask you, how precious am I? How precious am I? That's what you need to be asking yourself when you look in the mirror. Because beloved, you're so <coughs> precious. That before God created you, before God created the earth, before God created anything, He thought of you and said, I love you. And this is how much I'm willing to give my son for you. How can you put a value on that? How can I? The devil lies to you. He says, oh, you can't do that. Oh, you're not worth anything. God really doesn't love you. He's taken from you. Just like he told Eve. He said, well, we can eat about any tree except this one. Oh, you can eat of that. God just doesn't want you to be like him. Listen to the lies. The devil's lying when he says you can't succeed. The devil's lying when he says you can't succeed. You will fail. That you're not worth anything. You're worth the life of the Son of God. That's how much you're worth. But God explains this even more. It helps us to understand this even more. Turn with me to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1. And listen to what God has to say about His plan for you. Is the eternal plan. See, God is all. God is eternal, and God plans for us to be with Him for all eternity. Listen to Ephesians, starting with verse three, chapter one. He planned it and prepared it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Are you listening? Spiritual blessings. Eternal blessings in Christ Jesus. And when did He do this? You've already read that a while ago. Titus 1 and 2. Before the foundation of the world. Before the world began. God planned this. Verse 4. According 
as He hath chosen us in Him. When did He choose us? Before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and without blame before Him. Beloved, the only way we can be holy and without blame is through the blood of Christ. With the sacrifice of Christ. God planned this for you. That's how much God loves you. Well, we can read it, and the world can read it. God so loved the world, beloved. But, and, that, and you will not change the context of that verse when you put the word me. And God so loved me. God loves you. And He's telling you how much. Are you listening? Verse 5. Having predestinated us, in other words, pre planned, decided what the result would be, unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. In other words, he planned that we would be his children. He planned that we'd be, we would be joint heirs with Christ. For eternal life in the kingdom of heaven. And who is us? It is those who believe on him and are faithful to him. Who obey the gospel as commanded, who worship according to his word, not according to men's doctrines, for there is no other name under heaven in which man can have salvation except the name Jesus Christ. Not John Wesley. Not John Smith, not any of the names that we can name that are recognized around the world as religious people, only in Jesus Christ. <coughs> Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the beloved. In other words, made us a part of the family, the family of God, the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 tells us that we are the body of Christ. Ephesians 1.22, the body is the church. The church is the body of Christ. He is the head of the church. We are the body of those who will be saved, who are predestined by God to be the ones who inherit eternal life. Are you finding out? Are you seeing how valuable you are? How precious you are? He purchased and procured this through His Son. Drop down to verse 7. Let's read 7 through 12 together. In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. How big is His grace? Romans chapter 5. It talks about the grace wherein you stand. In the Greek, in the original Greek, it gives you a description as though you're standing in a vast ocean. So how big is the grace? It's vast. It's huge. And it's in Christ Jesus only that grace can be found. It is grace that God extends to us. Look at that verse again, verse 7. In whom we have redemption. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8. And preceding that, it says we are justified by His blood, brought back into a right relationship with Him, that we might be saved through wrath, that is the wrath of God on those who know not Him, who, who obey not the gospel, that God will punish. Not those who are chosen. <coughs> chosen how? Predestined. Preordained by God before the foundation of the world that those who obey and love Him and serve Him and do His will will be recipients of eternal life. Those who choose to live as the world says to live, those who choose to turn their back on the sacrifice Christ made upon their behalf, as Paul refers to, to trample under their feet. Those are the ones that are in trouble. Notice what else he says. The forgiveness of sins. What are sins? Romans 
tells us 3.23, 3.21 tells us in Romans that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us have done wrong. Every one of us have made a mistake. But what is sin? We can turn over to 1 John and find that sin is the transgression of God's law. What law do we live under today? We live under the New Testament law. As we find in Hebrews chapter 8 where it explains very clearly that with the death of the testator, that would be Christ, he made the testament a force or a law that we live under today. So when we sin, it means we have violated the law that God has set for us to follow in the New Testament. So we've all made mistakes. We've all stumbled. We've all fallen. We've all transgressed God's law. We're all in need. The world is in need of the sacrifice that Christ made by willingly going to the cross loving us so much Christ didn't want to have to die he prayed in the garden if it be possible let this cup pass from me three times and nevertheless thy will be done though he were son yet learned he obedience even to the death of the cross and we can read in Hebrews that he did so why for you for me our purpose that we might have forgiveness of sins that we might have eternal life see the Lord loves us he knew he was there it was through Christ that all things were created first John chapter 1 he was there he knew what God purposed in his mind when he decided that he would become a man and live amongst us he knew that he would suffer and die on a cruel cross of Calvary he knew he would be rejected he knew he would be beaten he knew he would be crucified and spat upon, ridiculed, made fun of, rejected. He knew all those things. But he did it. Why? Because he loves you. That's why we're told in 1 John very clearly that he laid down his life for us. Just as he laid down his life for us, so we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. This is love. And we read that a moment ago. Here in his love. That we love God, but that God loved us. How much did He love us? To give His Son to die. The cruelest, harshest death possible. Are you, are you figuring out how much you're worth? How precious are you? Look at verse 8. Wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Abounded means overflowing. His grace is overflowing. He's abounding it to you. He said, here, take this. It's a free gift. All you have to do is obey me and love me. Keep my commandments, John 14, 15. Having made known unto us the mystery of Israel, what was that? That Christ would come and die for us? According to His good pleasure, which He had purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullest of times, that is when the time was right, Christ came and dwelt among us. He might gather together in one. And who is the one? Christ. Together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him. He planned this. Christ went along with it. Christ fulfilled the will of the Father because He loves you. Remember the prayer? Those that thou hast given me, He prayed that they would be one in Him even as He was in the Father are one. One in unity, in mind, in heart, in soul, in love, in spirit. Verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullest of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance in Christ. Obtained an inheritance being predestinated, where when did we find this was done? Before the foundation of the world. When time didn't exist, but eternity was there. <clears throat> Look at 
predestined according to the purpose of Him who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will. God makes things happen the way He wants them to happen. Nothing man can do, nothing the devil can do can thwart the will of God. Nothing can change what God has determined to do. The devil tried. The devil even tried tempting Christ, didn't he? He tried to get rid of him using Judas. He tried. It didn't work. Because he can't stop the will of God. Love of the will of God is that you love Him, that you serve Him, that you become joint heirs with Christ for the kingdom of heaven. That's God's will. That's what God wants. We find that in Peter. That God is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of Him. And what? Be saved. That's what God's will is for you. He's patiently waiting. Verse 12. That we should be the praise of His glory who first what? Trusted in Christ. We trust God. Something else to think about. God reserved and proclaimed all this by the Spirit, by the Word of God that we are reading here today. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that, you believe. You notice you hear the gospel. You hear the gospel. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We hear about him, just like Peter on the day of Pentecost when he stood up and proclaimed that Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior, that he came and that they had crucified him, the Son of the living God. When they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. They were touched. They realized they'd done wrong. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? What can we do? And when Peter presented to them the gospel, believe, repent. Be baptized for the remission of your sins. For the promises to you and to the many as are far are off, that would be including us today. The promise of what? Eternal life. He said you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What is the gift of God? The Holy Spirit is God. What is the gift of God? The gift of God is eternal life. how much God loves you. The gospel of your salvation in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Ephesians 1.13. Sealed. What do we, how are we sealed? God tells you very clearly in John that when we believe we hear and we obey. We do the commandments of God. We demonstrate our love to Him. John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. When we demonstrate our love to Him and obey what He's commanded for us to do, that both I, the Scripture says, both I and the Father will love Him and will come to Him and make our abode with Him. We then become the temple of God who dwells in us. Paul refers to it as receiving the spirit of adoption. That's how we become members of the body of Christ. That's how we become children of God. <coughs> He's explaining it to you by illustration. And that's what Paul's talking about here. When we are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, we then are joint heirs with Christ for the kingdom of heaven. When? After we believe and obey. Verse 14. Which is the earnest. This is only a down payment. The blessings that we receive now are only a small portion of what the blessings we will receive in heaven. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us, I have not seen nor ear heard all that God has planned for us in heaven. That means when we read the book of Revelation, and John does his best to describe what heaven looks like. It's even greater than that. But he did his best to describe something that we consider beautiful. This is going to be greater than that. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession of us until the Lord returns. Redemption, redeemed, 
buying back. You are bought with a price. The Lord paid for you. And that price was the Son of God. That's how much you're worth. Unto the praise of His glory, because He is God and because He loves you. Now back to that question a moment ago. How precious am I? How precious are you? Beloved, you are more precious than you can imagine. You are worth so much that the price paid for your salvation, the price paid for your eternal life, the price paid for you is the life of the Son of God. So when you look in that mirror and you hear the devil's taunts and lies, I'm not worthy. I'm not any good. I can't do that. I can't accomplish that. Don't listen to them. God looked at you and saw something special. Saw something precious. So precious, so wonderful in His sight. And he was willing to allow His Son to die. That's how precious you are. If you're here this morning and you're not a child of God, consider what I've shown you today in the Scriptures, how precious you are. God has made it possible. God has made, paid the price. Think of it as boarding a train. All you have to do is take the ticket and board the train. The price has been paid for the ticket. Are you going to heaven? That's where God wants you to be. Or are you going to be punished because you chose to live the life of this world instead? The life of Christ was paid for the price of your, ability, your opportunity to go to heaven. Don't neglect that precious price. Don't neglect that precious gift. Would you respond today to whatever need you have in Christ Jesus as we together stand and invite you to something?